So the micro, micro, micro RPG. Oh my. This week on Backward Compatible, Brian McKittrick returns with more non-traditional tabletop RPGs. Goblin Quest, The Warren, Gangland, Danger Patrol, and more. Plus, Chris talks about exploding kittens and the one tweet RPG it inspired. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 40 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, everybody. And unfortunately, Jim was not able to join us, but we do have a guest on today, a returning guest, Brian McKittrick. I'm returning. Where, where is he? <laughs> yeah, where are you right now? Houston. Houston, yep. Oh. Skype in from Houston. Oh, I, I, thought, I thought it was just a voice in my head. Uh, um, yeah, right, I'm having uh, flashbacks of when Jim and I would Skype when he was in Houston. So. Jim and I. Jim and I. The Jim and I program. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be talking a bit today about uh, kind of a part two, if you will, to our uh, oddball and non-traditional RPGs discussion that we had last time Brian was on. Woo-hoo. I've been looking forward to this. So this should be lots of fun. Uh, but I guess we might as well go in and jump right into our opening segments, including the button mosh. Mosh, 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 mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I have been playing something called Castle Storm. Uh, it's not something that I would normally play, but hey, it was free, so I gave it a shot. Um, and I probably won't be playing it again. Basically, it's a two and a half D. Can I say that without getting slapped? I don't know. No, you won't get slapped by me. Okay, fair enough. I can't uh, slap you. You're in a, in, in a different city. <laughs> that's true. So it's a two and a half D. It's a two point seven five D mm. uh, strategy ish kind of game that uh, requires you to shoot a javelin a lot. Mm. You can teleport into your hero, who can go down and uh, defend your castle manually. But it's essentially. Well, I mean, it's it's not even really a castle defense game because there's not even, like, well, I guess it is a castle defense, but it's not it's not a tower defense game because there are no towers. Mm. Um, how do I explain it? You you level up your javelins, you shoot things as they come at your castle, and uh, you try to catapult stuff at the enemy castle as well, which mysteriously was built about two hundred yards away from your castle. It's kind of like Angry Birds without the cool bird aspect. There's a lot of Angry Bird-like games. And in fact, I'm sure there are some people who uh, are old-school internet Flash gamers who will tell you that Angry Birds is a rip-off of a whole bunch of different Flash games well, that used to play. Well, that's probably true. Um, did, those, oh, yeah. did those have like knights and, and Vikings and stuff that would come at your castle? I'm sure some of them did, yeah. Okay. Have you ever heard of a game called Defend Your Castle? Mm, I've heard the name, no, yeah. No. Yeah, it was one of those Flash games that was super cheap and somehow became super popular and kind of defined a lot of flash games because it was so fun oh, or nice. popular oh, okay um well, now in, in this case what do you mean by 2.5d are you talking 2d like side scrolling game with yeah it's graphics? basically side scrolling hmm. the problem i had with it was it's just it it was too needlessly complicated honestly the controls were, were kind of wiggy i found myself shooting javelins into the ground more often than not just because you have to control the camera with your R stick. You have to control the javelin with your L stick, and in order to uh, adjust, you know, in, in small increments, you have to be all the way out. Like you have to push all the way over and then up and down. So it's like the further over you are, the more oh, you're fine tuning the yeah, you're okay. fine tuning. And it just I don't know, it just didn't work for me. Um, there, there's kind of a plot and there's kind of characters. You're like, oh, it's the evil magician who's going to take over and he's responsible for everything. Like the instant he shows up, yeah. okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, but as soon as I thought I figured out exactly what I was supposed to be doing, it, it, it just didn't. I don't know. But there is a castle editor, and that that looked kind of promising. Um, that you can actually edit your castle to be the way that you want it to be, and and that, I don't know. That, that kind of a neat aspect to it. it made me think about like. What if Angry Birds was the other way around, and you were like doing PvP mm. Angry Birds? You know, you had your castle, I had my castle, and that took me to kind of like a Worms 
place, which okay. was one of my favorites <laughs> of all time ever. Nice. Um, I, I still want to do like a board game version of Worms and then just totally rip them off. But. I'm almost wondering if there was an Angry Birds game that had like Angry Birds reversed. I do know that there was a game called Bad Piggies. It was the first yeah, one we yeah, played yeah, as the pigs, that but that was more of a uh, build a vehicle and try to get through an obstacle course yeah, sort of thing. I do remember that. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's that's what I spent some time doing today. Um, not today, this week. And uh, other than that, I've been spending a lot of time in mobile, but I will hold that. All right. Until the mobile minute. Uh, Brian, what have you been up to? Crypt to the neck or dancer? Dancer what? or mancer? No, it's a D. It's d- a dancer. Is, oh, okay. is, isn't that the guy from Tales from the Crypt? Crypto? I've never... Is that a reference from the 90s? Oh, yeah. Probably, yeah. Actually, yeah, there we and go. I'm wrong anyway. That was the Crypt Keeper. Crypto's actually the guy from Destroy All Humans, so I take it back. Wasn't Tales from the Crypt basically like um, another Are You Afraid of the Dark slash Goosebumps sort of show? Yeah, but it was on HBO, so it had nudie bits. Oh, okay. Ooh. So it wasn't necessarily for kids then. Oh, it definitely wasn't for kids. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's no nudity in Crypt of the Necker Dancer. Crypt of the Necker Dancer is a rhythm roguelike. Okay. So you move in time with the beat to earn a multiplier to get more gold and so on. Wait, say that again? It's a what? It's a rhythm roguelike. The levels are randomly generated, and uh, you have to move in time with the music. I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that is. You have to try it to You've find out. You've never played a roguelike? Well, no, I know exactly what a roguelike is. I don't know what a roguelike is. Have you ever played D- uh, DDR? Yeah, like DDR. Yeah, yeah, so, so literally this has like a, a, a pad hooked up to your... Well, you can no, hook but, up a pad. <laughs> I guess you can. So, But basically the idea is you're merging the idea of a rhythm game and like fusing that into a roguelike style game. So could... So. Could you? Could one? I, I'm not going to say me because I don't have one. But could one use their guitar from Guitar Hero and play this game? I don't think so. Oh, that's kind of disappointing. That would be the uh, the metal version. Yeah, seriously. I, Crypt of the um, Necro Mosher. Some, I don't know. Well, there it. Well, um, there are multiple characters you can play as, um, and three or two of them have uh, their own soundtracks that take the original soundtrack and then do it in a different style. So then uh, you have the metal version and the, uh, I think it's uh, a techno-electronic, oh, or nice. EDM version. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Actually, and sounds kind of cool. I'm going to have to check this out. <laughs> yeah, the music's all really good. But you can also um, substitute your own MP3s in, and, uh, and you can play the levels with them. I, I guess it does that thing where it uh, tries to detect the BPM just from your track. You can, uh, you can tell it... Um, the tempo to have the BPM at, or you can manually uh, input the BPM yourself for the okay. entire song. So it's not like some programs that will do that for you automatically. I think um, there is, there are like th- third party utilities uh, that can do it, but um, I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't done it myself. Okay. So Somebody needs been... to get with Harmonix or possibly Activision and be like, hey, guys, here's the thing uh, Guitar Hero. Mm-hmm. Go. The thing about the game is that I, I've, it's like, Many roguelikes, you have to have a lot of luck and a lot of skill to actually beat them all the way. Yeah, and I, I That's just true. very recently beat the secret boss, or Ooh. technically the very last boss, which is an incredibly long slog through all the levels in the game with the the weakest weapon and only one hit point. So you could not make a single mistake. Oh, and you die on a <laughs> wow. single missed beat. Oh wow! Oh wow! So you have to stay in time with the music the entire time. Wow! So this game is called Crypt of the What Necro, Necro Dancer. Dancer. Necro Dance. Are you the Necro Dancer, or is the no. Necro Dancer the bad guy? Uh, he's the bad guy. Okay, well that would make sense. Okay. Either that, or just a convenient pun, and there's actually no necromancy at all. No, there's lots of necromancy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Deadheads. Well, there are skeletons that dance. The, the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, there's Xylobones. Sorry, that was another pre-90s reference. <laughs> we could go on. Um, but yeah, so what I've been playing recently... Um, actually, I haven't played a lot this week. I've been doing lots and lots of editing mainly. Um, speaking of which... Uh, we salute you for it. Yes. So you've exactly. been playing Audacity. Yes. <laughs> actually, no, I've been playing a <laughs> Final, a Final Cut is what I've been playing. Um, but the uh, as of the time of recording, and at the time you'll be hearing this, we will have put out um, at least one episode of uh, Roll With It. Season yeah. two, yeah, um, River of Time. So, in fact, Brian, you were in that River mm-hmm. of Time. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, uh, 
when I have been playing games, not this week, I've been playing a lot of Rocket League, um, and this is actually not a uh, Get Wrecked segment, because I've been playing a little bit of the um, offline season mode, single player season mode. And the idea is that you have a team of three, um, and two of your teammates are AIs, you can actually pick um, which AIs you want to have on your team, I don't know if they've got different personalities or if it's just aesthetic um, but they've got like these little nicknames and they got cars with you know decals <laughs> on them. And um, you also pick the logo for your team, which then also picks the two, like the primary and the secondary color for your team. Um, and then you can also rename the team if you want, but usually the name that's built into it fits the logo better than most um, things you could come up with. So team awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, like there's uh, the Cyclones, the Rebels, um, stuff like that. Team Doc is awesome. <laughs> Team Doc is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and so it's uh, three-on-three Rocket League matches, and um, I forget if you can change the number of weeks in a season, um, but you basically just play through a season uh, round-robin style, and then uh, the top, you can change how many teams go into the playoffs in the last few weeks. Um, by default, it's just four-team playoff, so I think it's like a 10-team league, four-team playoff. Um, you play like 25 weeks, um, one game a week. Uh, see who's got the best record going to the playoffs and then try to win the whole thing by getting through the playoffs. That's cool. I have played none of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I was the one who first talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago, but... um I, yeah, I, I want to get back in there and, and play the single player mode. That sounds amazing. Yeah, you know, what's and, nice about it is that um, you get practice against pretty competent AIs. Um, and the AIs tend to be a little bit better than some of your online randomly picked up um, uh, teammates. Yeah, I was going to say that's uh, true about, for most online games. Yeah, really, yeah, uh, they, they tend to be better about like controlling the ball. Um, setting you up for assists, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people uh, online will do this as well, especially as you get into the higher tiers. Well, that's true. Um, that. But yeah, there's still the people who come on. And uh, I think it was uh, Aaron Hansen who said on Twitter uh, the game. Uh, a lot of people just think the game should have been called be uh, should instead be called touch ball. Who cares uh, where it goes as long as you touch it? Yeah, <laughs> or just touch it. Um, so yeah, which is definitely true of the uh, the rookie level play. But um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good way to sort of practice without having to you know like find a match and then like uh, if you're playing ranked matches, exit game, look for another match, join that match. I mean, like just the waiting for matches can be kind of tedious. So this um, bypasses all that and it's kind of nice. Excellent. So, hashtag not get wrecked. <laughs> it's not hashtag get wrecked. Here we go. Not wrecked. <laughs> not wrecked. Uh, yeah, anyway, I was going to go with another pun, but I decided it might be a bad idea. <laughs> inappropriate? Yeah. <laughs> Awkward pause. It, it, it's, it's not that it's inappropriate inherently, it's just the internet will make it inappropriate because that's what the internet does. It's time for Table Talk. <laughs> Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So I had a chance recently to play Exploding Kittens. Um, the you madman. <laughs> the, the record-setting... Oh, uh, the board game. Yes, oh. the, the, card game. the card game. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the record-setting uh, Kickstarter project that uh, was so popular they had problems getting it out to everyone. That's true, actually. Um, we, we know people on that team, so mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting. So shout-out to you guys. You guys are awesome. Actually, they are. Um, but I'm going to have to give a little bit of real talk here about the game, though. Um... It is, and I I don't think it had any illusions about what it was and wasn't, to be fair. Um, It is an extremely simple game. They're not kidding when they say you can learn in about 10 seconds and play it in 15 minutes. Uh, Actually, our game, I think, took like 30 or 40 minutes, um, partially because we were just distracted and partially because um, I think two of us got really lucky draws and were able to keep keep the game going for a very long time. Uh But the idea of the game is basically you draw a hand of cards... Uh, on your turn, you want to. You can choose not to play any cards, but you can play up to as many cards as you want, um, following the instructions on said cards. Um, and if you are, and then after you've played all your cards, you have to draw a card from the deck, unless a card tells you you don't have to draw. Um, when you draw a card, if it is an exploding kitten card, um, you explode and you're out of the game, and the last one standing wins. Um, so. The way to counter this is everyone gets a free diffuse card at the beginning of the game. The diffuse card basically lets you reshuffle that card back into the deck, or actually you place it back in the deck, which means that if you want to, you can sort of target a specific player. Mm. You know that unless other, unless they play a card that lets them do otherwise in three turns, they're going to draw the card, and so you can kind of be a jerk if you want to. Um, or you can just shuffle back into the deck however you want. Um, and then like there are cards that let you uh, skip your turn, um, make the person next to you, um, draw twice, that sort of thing. Um, 
So, extremely simple game, um, and it works, like, there's a little bit of strategy to it as far as um, knowing when you want to say, like, preview the next few cards, like, we kind of got, like, I've got a bad feeling about this, so I'm going to see the next three cards and decide if I want to play something else to skip or to mess with someone else. Um, so Why the, is this reminding me of Uno? I haven't played Uno recently enough to really know how it works, but... I You've forgotten how Uno works? I, I mean, I know you say Uno when you've got one card left in your hand, but... Well, there's draw fours, there's draw threes, there's reverse cards, mm. there's skip you cards. To, That's you play a card a that is the same color or the same number as the card played previously. Right, right. Okay. And the idea is to empty your hand, right? right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, whereas in this case, it's just be the last one to not be killed by an exploding kitten. Um... Darn those exploding yeah. kittens. I, it definitely the, one of the biggest draws of the game, and I think the reason that it was so um, popular when it got um, funded is that the uh, artist from The Oatmeal, the webcomic, um, did all the art for the game. Um, and so there's just a bunch of like goofy drawings of kittens and other objects and stuff like that, kind of funny scenarios about like a... Thousand-year um, back, back hair? Yeah, stuff like that. Um, so, and some of it is actually kind of funny, but it's, it's not really my style of humor. So I didn't find it Mm -hmm. like worth like the cards. So, um, I don't know. It's, I, I had enough fun with the game to be like, haha, that was all right. And then I don't really ever want to play it again. So did you, or did you not play the NSFW version? Uh, actually we played with both decks. Did you? Yeah, we mixed. Was it a significant enough change to the gameplay to no no change to the gameplay it was purely just the cards that are not family friendly i see and even then most of them weren't really all that bad it was just like bad enough that like you don't want your five-year-old playing well i wasn't thinking rule changes but Mm -hmm. i was thinking the the tone of the game shifts because of the adult nature of the cards no it's just that there there are more cards to be had yeah more more adults might find the cards funnier and the NSF, okay. NSFW version. But it's not particularly... Well, we're not talking Cards Against Humanity. Like no, no, there. no, not okay. at all. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I still have not bathed enough after playing that game. <laughs> Last time we pay, played it was, like, right after I graduated. I'm fairly certain that, that it was yesterday, because it's fresh in my mind. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, anyway, so I, I will say that it's a... On a fundamental level, Exploding Kittens is a solid game. Um, it's not particularly strategic. Um, it's more of kind of like a break it out at a party, and it's a fun gimmick, you know. But it's I, don't know, I wasn't incredibly impressed as like from like a game designer perspective, you know. I didn't really expect to be quite yeah. frankly. So. No, neither did I. But yeah. what's interesting though is I have literally seen about four different copies of it since it shipped, mm-hmm. um, and you know our favorite local game store doesn't carry copies mm. it's probably so, because they're too busy fulfilling everyone who pre-ordered so to speak right before they i thought it even... was because it, it's a kickstarter yeah it is oh that's true so right now they're just doing backer rewards and not worrying about right. um retail so but you know in, interesting that it was influential enough that i have personally seen four copies of it mm. yeah there you go but anyway it was record breaking so um but that's actually a pretty good segue into our next segment which is the one tweet rpg of the week and now, the official One Tweet RPG of the Week. Uh, try at Epidiah. That is the guy who designed the RPG Dread. Uh, is that spelled? Uh, E-P-I-D-I-A-H. Sounds like a disease. <laughs> um, I think it's... It's someone's name. Yeah. His, uh, his sort of um, pseudonym, if you will, is Epidire Wolf. Um, oh, I get it. E p i d i r e w o l w o l f. And to be fair, many diseases are named after people, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't think he has. Yeah, so that is the guy who designed um, the RPG Dread, which of course is famous for or infamous. However, in, in circles that have heard about it, you'll know it as the RPG where you pull Jenga tower blocks. Um, and it's horrific because the tension builds and whatnot. Well, that's appropriate for our uh, meaty topic today. Yes, indeed. Um, you could maybe call it a non-traditional slash oddball RPG. Um, but play oh, Dread cool. with Game of Kittens, or at Game of Kittens, which is uh, Exploding Kittens, uh, turns instead of Jenga pulls. This may have a more PvP feel, could base the fiction on played cards. So the idea here is that where... Um, it, it was funny because actually as we were playing the game, I was sort of... Um, internally analyzing the design of Exploding Kittens. <laughs> and one of the things that I noticed is, like, if there is any sort of, like, 
the, the fun factor, aside from the humor, probably comes from the building of tension, where you know that as the deck gets smaller, it's more and more likely they're going to draw the exploding kitten card and be out yeah. of the game, so it's, it's tense, potentially. Um, so... Dread is built on the same principle, that the Jenga Tower gets more and more unstable as you go, and you know that the next pull could be the thing that kills you. Um, so my thought was that basically every time you would have to pull a block from the Jenga Tower in Dread, instead you would play a turn of Game of Kittens, and of course it could, or uh, Exploding Kittens, then referring to the Trodama. Um You would go in any order at this point, um, because it's the order in which you would be pulling from the tower. Um, or doing a turn rather than going around in a circle. But the idea being that as you keep going, that keeps getting smaller, um, you're more and more likely to draw that Exploding Kitten card, but you also have ways to diffuse and to deflect. Um, And so essentially what you could do is have a party of players where you're, in a way, um, trying to get them to draw the Exploding Kitten before you do. And I guess some games of Dread might go that direction in the sense that, like, if if your character is just about getting out alive no matter what, you know, you could be trying to um, sort of do the old... uh, shoot the fat guy in the leg to let them get eaten by the zombies um, maneuver. Uh, but Poor fat guy. Yeah. <laughs> the, well, uh, isn't, it, isn't it in Dread the, there is the option, instead of trying to pull a, um, uh, a piece from the tower, you can just knock the tower over to immediately succeed the action, but mark your character for, for death as yeah. a I'm sure sacrifice. Noble sacrifice yeah. Yeah. How would you do that in Exploding Kittens, then? Um, I don't know that you would, except maybe you um, you draw the Exploding Kitten and... Um, choose not to use a defuse? Yeah. That makes sense. And or um, choose to basically um, take a loss, but um, reshuffle the whole deck. Potentially. Cool. As opposed to like letting it be like the last three that you know are all exploding kittens or something like that. I, I want to try this now. I'm mm-hmm. thinking maybe a roll with it unplugged. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the, the last little thing about um, uh, basing the fiction on the cards, you can actually take cues from the cards themselves, the flavor text on the cards, um, to say like this is stuff that's happening and it would be kind of like this very surrealist sort of horror thing potentially. Yeah. Oh, the back so. hair, no! <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that's the uh, one tweet RPG of the week. And actually, um, one of the reasons I want to mention it too is that I actually got a retweet from the designer of Dread. Um, so that was kind of cool. cool. Hey, for more Dread action, tune in to Geek and Sundry. They did a, a play. Yep, and they did. Brian, on, uh, what was the other podcast Death that Club. that you were mentioning to me? That uh, did one Shot RPG did a couple of episodes. On one Dread. Shot RPG. That's right. But you'll have to go through their archives. Oh well, fair enough. As as well worth doing, because they're a really cool actual play podcast. Now it's time for Let's Watch Let's Plays, the part of our show about games, about shows about games. Yeah, so speaking of Geek and Sundry, Mm -hmm. we've mentioned on the show before Titan's Grave, um, The Ashes of Alcana. It is a um, very highly produced um, web series where Will Wheaton and friends play... um, the recently released uh, Fantasy Age system in a setting that they developed original for the show, and actually they've got a source book now for that system that you can buy if you want to play in their world. Um, but they just concluded their 10-episode uh, um, first season, and they have confirmed a second season. Um, they did before the finale, but if that wasn't out there, then the finale itself probably would have confirmed it for you without yeah, they, spoiling too much. <laughs> they darn well better do a second season after that cliffhanger. Um, so we're not going to spend too much time on this right now because actually at some point Doc and I were planning to sit down and do a one-on-one, um, I guess you can call it like a, uh, we don't want to call it a critique necessarily, but a critical analysis. Fist fight, right? Yes, yeah. that's what it was. <laughs> a critical analysis, a.k.a. fist fight, of the um, the series and talking about uh, things we did and didn't like about the production, the narrative. Um, Episode 9! <laughs> <yeah. laughs> Episode nine's probably going to be an interesting uh, uh, point of discussion for those of you who don't know what we're talking about. Just go watch the series. Um, yeah, so we just want to give a quick teaser for that. And also, um, I would personally like to congratulate the people involved with it because I think it was a very cool um, series overall. Um, I personally enjoyed it. And it's also um, becoming more and more, it seems, a sort of ambassador sort of show for role-playing. And, yeah, you know, for sure. A lot of people have been um, sort of touting it as being like the next thing that's going to help people get into tabletop role-playing games, which well, you is know, never bad. There's a lot of actual play shows out there, but that one is produced, like heavily produced in mm-hmm. a way that um, if you... I know you and I have watched some of the behind-the-scenes stuff and mm-hmm. some of the meta stuff. 
um, it, it's really impressive the amount of work that goes into that. And yeah. The credits, if you, <laughs> if you watch the credits whenever uh, you watch the show, the episode. Um, they take three-hour sessions and boil them down into 40-minute episodes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, we've taken some inspiration from that mm-hmm. ourselves with um, Roll With mm-hmm. It and some of the things that we're doing there. So, mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, it was interesting because I think I've mentioned this briefly before, but I actually, we put out the first couple episodes of Roll With It before I ever saw the first episode of Titans Grave. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it was interesting. It's like, oh, hey, they're doing a lot of the same things that I am. And then since then, I've also been taking a few kind of cues like, oh, that was a cool idea, or maybe we could try this moving forward. So, Well, I'm sure they, they took cues from us, too. Oh, yeah. As totally. you know. We, we've um, got lots of loyal listeners all over the place. Yeah, Will and, Wheaton and, is one of our biggest fans. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if he's a big fan of Jim after that one incident. You but. know, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, well, we certainly don't have uh, uh, Shia LaBeouf on our side. Not oh. after the thing I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, buff. <laughs> we'll make it up to him by running actual Cannibal one of these days. Well, yeah, and then it's, it's going to be all. the same thing. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, but in that help. case, you'll, it'll be very hard for you to actually win against Shia LaBeouf. John will not survive. <laughs> <laughs> Poor John. So, yeah, stay tuned for our Titan's Grave. Um, actual Cannibal Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the player codex entry that will be hitting backward compatible very soon. There we go. I was going to go with Art Chautauqua, but that works. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. Yeah, I kind of hinted at this a minute ago, so I will talk straight up about loot and legends. In short, it is a uh, free-to-download game that, in my opinion, does the pay model very, very well. There are no ads to have to slog through. It's by Drop Forge Games, uh, which I really hadn't heard of prior to this, but as I understand it, it is based on a, uh, let's call it an online sort of PC version of the same thing. Uh, This one's a little more polished, it's a little more refined, and what it comes down to is you've got this uh, meta fiction that is Loot and Legends is this old game from, let's call it the 80s, D&D style RPG, which is very much about um, trashing the bad guys and going through and earning XP and earning uh, loot and that sort of a thing. But what you've got is this teenager who finds his brother's copy of this and decides to run us, the player, through it. And so... Uh, overlaid on this whole thing about uh, going and killing slub gut and uh, leveling up your character and doing all the cool mechanics and stuff is this teenager who's got this crush on the pizza girl and she shows up every game and uh, you've got the the brother who's like no this is the way you do real things and he's kind of a rules lawyer and Mm. you kind of get to know the characters um, so that whenever you defeat a random enemy, it's not a random enemy. It's a random enemy being controlled by this character that you actually like. Um, and even if you lose, he's like, oh, wow, yeah, that was kind of rough. Let's do it again. Mm. And you run through the same scenario again. And it gives it a little bit more heart, a little bit more meaning. Um, that aside, the mechanics are actually really solid because you build your character based on a card mechanic. It's a card draw mechanic, which is not truly random because it's a... It's a known quality whenever you shuffle a card deck together. And you can kind of build it almost um, Hearthstone style, which is in and of itself kind of fun. Uh, Chris and I are fans of Hearthstone, so uh, no surprise there that I have spent uh, countless hours this week, probably 20, 25 hours this week, just playing Loot and Legends. So um, what else is there to say? Well, uh, You build out your deck the way you want to based on the cards you get. You can go into arena mode if you're stuck on um, something that's in the solo. And uh, although it's not PvP, it is um, a progressive uh, little... uh, AI-controlled player party. Yeah, it's a progressive AI-controlled player party that has a a time limit. So basically there's a new one each week, that kind of a thing. And if you can get to the end, you can get the cool loot, you can get all that kind of stuff. But even if you don't, there's pretty good rewards. Mm -hmm. The one complaint that I have seen fairly consistently is that there is a dual economy within the game, as you might expect from the mobile 
um, which is heavily informed by those uh, Facebook games. Oh yeah, you know. Uh, so basically, not only have you got coin, but which is pretty easy to earn, mm-hmm. uh, but you've also got pizza. Uh. Uh, so you know, like right now, I've got like sixty pizza, and if I can get it up to a hundred pizza, I can buy an epic chest or something. Now, does the pizza expire after a while? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> but what does expire? So I'm getting meta with it. Ah, oh, I see. That's yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> but what does expire is your membership to the club. And this is probably the the biggest complaint that I have seen. If you are a club member, there's certain loot that you can cash out. It's almost like MMO style stuff. Mm. Uh, I know like right now with um, uh, Star Wars, uh, The Old Republic, mm-hmm. for example, it's free to play. But if you really want to play it and you really want to get the good stuff and you want to get the extra XP and you want to get the good loot and you want to get all that stuff, you kind of need to be a paid member. Mm. Uh, if you want to be a real player. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's the same way or, or actually what's funny is that like, you, it's definitely like that, that model, sorry to sidetrack us a little bit, but no, that no. model is definitely intended to um, steer you towards subscription because you discover very quickly that you'd be saving a lot of money just subscribing yeah. versus paying for everything you need to pay for. Exactly. <laughs> and that's actually the big complaint about Loot and Legends, which is um, I can buy a club membership for one week and I get you know two days free. So basically we're calling it a nine-day um, subscription to this club membership where I get the cool loot and I get all the cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's going to cost me 500 pizza to do that. Uh, okay, well, I, let me go buy 500 pizza. Well, I can't buy 500 pizza. I can buy 600 pizza. <laughs> And that's going to cost me ten bucks. Mm. So in order for me to continue to be a subscribing member, I'm in, it's going to cost me ten bucks a week. Wow! To play this, that's not worth it. Um, wow! There are in-game ways to earn it, but then you you're have, trading time for money. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I honestly wish there was this this one-time fee. I would be happy to pay twenty bucks. I just think the game is worth it. The quality is yeah, yeah. To just to permanently be a club member. Yeah. Um, we'll see if that happens. Mm. Loot and Legends, everyone. That was the moment. Uh, well, we've left lots of time this week for our meaty topic, and that was by design, because we've got Brian here, and we want to talk about Oddball RPGs Part 2. The beyond, returning... Beyond the Dungeons and the Dragons. Electric Google. <laughs> so, um, well, we did tell you on some of my favorite, or most favorite rpgs i could have thought of the the prior episode uh yeah what, or, what episode was that was it i don't remember uh i can look it up 30 you guys keep talking and the thing about this. rpgs is like they're they're like mushrooms after a good rain there's a bunch more that you go f- outside and find <laughs> but unlike mushrooms they don't taste weird or and or kill you and the metaphorical rain would be what kickstarter uh yeah i guess <laughs> Or, or a good movie series to serve as inspiration. Mm. A good layoff from Wizards of the Coast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'll do it, too. Um, anyway, I think... Well, Doc, you, you got to play this game very recently with me. Um, and it was my first time running it. Uh, and it was a very fun game where you got to do a very silly voice. Oh, yes. We're talking about Goblin Quest. Goblin Quest by was, Grant Howitt. It was 36 that we talked about. So. Oh, I was off by one. Goblin Quest by Grant Howitt is a, uh, call it a comedy adventure game, um, where you play goblins. Uh, goblins who have a lifespan measured in hours, <laughs> usually around a week, uh, and they want to make a mark on the world, uh, so they go out on a quest to make that mark. Uh, inevitably, they end up dying a lot, um, which is why you get five goblins per player. <laughs> Yeah, my my clutch, as they were called, uh, was piratey themed. They believed they were pirates. Nice, except for Smith, who got it. Well, that's true. He was the the meta goblin, which honestly didn't work out as well as I thought it would. So, as you're creating your goblins, um, and you think that the meta would be be fun, um, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked out. I mean, well, he did get eaten by. Zombie yeah, and I, goblins. I could have prevented it because because we were using the reroll rule, and I was like, no, no, he's he's had his time. <laughs> well, there's always a reroll rule. Ro- uh, the thing I like about Goblin Quest is that um, it's very modular. You That's can true. choose, and you can pick and choose which rules or which sets of of flavor you want to play as. We only did it as base Goblin Quest, uh, but included in the kicks or in the 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 game are a bunch of alternate tables you can roll on for mishaps and misfortunes. 
or example adventure ideas from other game designers uh, invited by Grant Yowett. I thought that was pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Uh, we actually used one of the alternate tables for Mishaps and Misfortunes because there was a possibility that we would have a reference to Paranoia, which I wish we had. Instead, we got the adventuring party in our boat. Ah, yes. Well, and, and we used the, what was it, it the, the adventure idea get boat? Yes. Where, wherein the goblins had found a boat and they were going to go out, which worked well and actually inspired my um, my idea for the piratey themed goblin clutch. Interesting. The uh, as written, the rules intend for the goblins um, to be made first, and then the quest be uh, derived from all the clutches' uh, personal goals, like their their dreams. So each ah. clutch has a dream, and those dreams taken together. Uh, inform the players what kind of quest they want to go on, and then they decide how to go about that. But you don't have to, so we picked a quest and went with it instead. What I liked most about the system was that you could choose a, a bunch of different aspects and qualities and you know beliefs and that sort of thing from that particular goblin and, and your particular family. Um, but the more dice you rolled, the higher chance there was that you were going to take a wound and die. Um, so you're actually endangering your goblins by using their abilities. But even if you die, you could still roll multiple successes. So it always technically can pay off to add more dice to the roll. Yeah, there, there's that's probably true. a sweet spot that you want to hit to to make sure that you don't end up killing your goblin every single roll while still maintaining a measure of success. Well, everything over four was a a good success positive thing that modified the next roll and everything underneath was a bad negative thing and that possibly killed your goblin off. So, and they yes. only had two health. Um, so I would think that it would balance out honestly. Yeah. Now, wasn't there a rule that you always have to talk in a goblin voice while playing this game? Yes, that is correct. So does that rule apply to talking about the game itself? No. Only when you're reading one specific paragraph within the rules. I see. Um, and you usually shift into it about halfway over, and, or halfway through it, unless you start the paragraph over. Okay. Yes. The, the, to reword that question is, uh, should we torture our listeners right now, or just maybe not? I don't want to torture my throat either. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, that's fair. Fair enough. Anyway, uh, what was uh, your overall impression of Goblin Quest? I, I loved it, and I would love to run it again. Um uh, I uh, there's so many other things like the the other misfortune and adventure ideas that we haven't even touched, and they're also included because of the Kickstarter nature of it. Um, alternate settings and systems rules so that you can play. Um, you killed my father. Prepare to die. Or no, <laughs> wait, was it? I, I forget what it's called, but it's basically each play, each character you play as is succeeding the is uh, avenging the death of the previous character who died. Oh. So, it, oh, no, it's, my name is Enigno Mentoya, prepare <laughs> to die, quest. So you're, you're playing uh, characters seeking to avenge the previous character's death. Uh, they still die as fast as the goblins, though. Oh, of course. Nice. And then there's also my personal favorite of the bunch that I, I would love to run if I saw more movies more often, uh, Sean Bean Quest. <laughs> where every movie that Sean Bean dies in is yeah. not a movie... That it's fiction. It's actual documentary about a multidimensional being called Sean Bean, who is cursed to die a thousand deaths. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. So oh, Sean Bean Quest it. is about a group of Sean Beans who've <laughs> crafted an amulet that enables one of them to become the one true Sean Bean who seeks out his final death. But if he dies before then, the next Sean Bean takes it and becomes the true Sean Bean. This and actually so sounds on. kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to play this now. You, you could also, um, well, you, you could play like the uh, Kevin Bacon variant. Mm. Where everyone knows no. Kevin Bacon somehow. Yeah. Um, and if I actually read or watched this show, uh, the Game of Thrones variant. Oh, there you go. Where characters die off so fast, even though you love them. <laughs> <laughs> the more you love them, the more, more you love them. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, the uh, the idea of the goblins dying very quickly and it all kind of being about the family um, reminds me of another RPG that I, um, I I had known about when we were doing the last episode, but didn't um, really like think to talk about it until afterward. We actually tweeted it out at one point. Um, but the Warren. 
was recently based on, on Kickstarter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's based on the Apocalypse World system, so the same one as Night Witches, which we mentioned. Uh, I believe we also mentioned Monster Hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one is about playing um, anthropomorphic in the sense that they think and reason and kind of, you know, um, have community like humans, but not anthropomorphic in the sense that they are literally rabbits. They're not, you know, um, humans with rabbit heads. Um, I, ha- I have a good way to pitch this one, actually. Mm-hmm. The Warren is essentially an RPG form of uh, Watership Down. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Where, where you get, like, the, the cover of the book has the cute fluffy bunnies, and you mm-hmm. think it's a nice kid's book, and then, and oh, then the you horror. actually read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. About, it's about the world is against the rabbits, and you must do everything in your power just to survive and make it to the next day. Mm-hmm. And the only thing you have on your side is your agility and speed. Yep. That's pretty much the Warren from what I understand. I actually went ahead and backed on Kickstarter and um, got the um, draft PDF. Um, so you can actually, you know, play test it and it's uh, play test it ahead of the final release, which actually I think we intend to do at some point for uh, roll with it unplugged. Nice. Um, so that is upcoming. Um, do I have to run it? Uh, no, I'm going to run it. Okay. Uh, so you get to be you get to be a nice cute little bunny. We're gonna we're gonna let Brian play. Mm. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Amazing Whoa. in an unplugged episode. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that uh, interestingly enough, Vincent Baker, one of the guys, or I guess the guy who designed Apocalypse World originally, um, called this one of the darkest interpretations of the system he's ever seen. Um, oh wow, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, uh, and what's interesting is there actually is a, a dark mode that you can play in the Warren. Um, if you want it to be kind of like uh, more uplifting and heroic, you can. But there's also a dark mode where if everyone at the table kind of agrees they want to do it, um, the game becomes more about the ongoing survival of your Warren than it is about the individual rabbits. Just like um, actual. You know, wildlife. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, when the rabbits die, do you have another rabbit that takes its place? And yeah, you, it got you, to breed. And, yeah. and he's Sean Bean. Mm-hmm. Breeding yeah. is actually a big part of the game, actually. You want to, um, like, one of your rabbits' goals is to live long enough to um, birth a litter. Um, and then that litter grows up to be the next generation of rabbits. Wow, sounds like Pendragon. Actually. Yeah, actually, that's one of the things that struck <laughs> me is as I was reading it, 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 it actually has a better... Um, sort of pace and focus on that than Pendragon does because Pendragon what intrigued me about it was the generational thing but then you discover that basically you play like or at least when we played it, it was one year per session mm-hmm. um, and there are many many years in your night's life so if you're playing like the three year weekly campaign um, of Pendragon then like you can get that generational thing but the thing that drew me to it was the idea of the generations and the Warren um, actually does that a lot better because you can kind of get through, if you sort of like play one or two adventures per generation, um, you can actually see quite a bit if you do a uh, extended campaign. That sounds amazing. Yeah, no, it, it actually looks really cool. I'm pretty excited to try it out. And on a similar note, um, the guy who wrote that Marshall Miller, um, I'm, let me double check his name. I believe it is. I thought right. you said Vincent Baker. Uh, Vincent Baker did um, Apocalypse World. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Marshall Miller is the name of the guy who designed the Warren, or wrote the Warren. And um, he has on his website a collection of... uh, I'll go and give his website real quick, one moment. FindMessGames.com. And on that website, uh, he has uh, nano games, a little collection of nano games, some of which he designed himself, some of which were designed um, by other people, and he just kind of lists all of the ones that he's found or thinks are worth listing. Um, okay, so you're going to have to define that term. What's a nano game? Oh, they've actually got a little definition thing around. Oh, website. well, read it to us. So, nano game, noun. Uh, one, a game that's smaller than a micro game or a mini game. <laughs> okay. uh, Two. Wait, so. So, what's a micro game? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two, a game contained on a card or similarly small format. Three, a game measured in words rather than pages. Mine's measured in characters, by the way. So. Oh, yeah. It is. <laughs> what does uh, that make it? Uh, smaller than a nano game. A Pico game. A Pico game. Pico game. <laughs> a, a tweet. Uh, four, a shockingly short but complete game, um, which you could argue that some of the one tweet RPGs are more prompts than they are complete games. Um, I so I, I the next logical, st- uh, let's, next logical step then would be the haiku game. <laughs> yeah, literally uh, a five seven five syllable RPG. It's, the entire session play? is five syllables, then seven yeah. syllables, then five. Well, actually, uh, speaking of haiku RPGs, there was a Kickstarter for, um, I think it was called like Haiku Warriors or something like that. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that it's a dungeon crawler RPG where basically you put out um, cards with monsters and moves and stuff on them. And on the cards, 
the flavor text is all in haiku. That's the silliest um, thing I've ever heard. Now I'm sure Will uh, Parsons would tell you that it's uh, it's not really true haiku because like true haiku has got like all these special rules about them. It's not just five seven five. But well, yeah, it's called being in a different language. Yeah, that too. Well, no, there's an English version, but there's something about like the uh, the half stop and the full stop and oh. uh, like the the con- like there always has to be a seasonal reference. That's too much algebra for me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Five, a science fiction-y descriptor for a tiny game, nano games. Um, six, an arbitrary term keeping neither design in nor designers out. Um, uh, what? <laughs> they know us. <laughs> etymology, um, a marketing term for small game, which came into vogue among independent game develop- and game designers in the spring of 2013. Very specific. Well, at least he cited his source. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, that's um, you can check out some of those nano games. But, yeah, it's, it's basically you, you sum up these games in you know paragraphs as opposed to pages um and it kind of usually gives you like a little bit of a situation that you can run with um a few basic rules for how to um resolve things um but in general these little nano games are meant to be like quick and potentially um odd rpgs that's cool i dig it yeah vincent baker um who is sometimes known as uh lumpley games because that is kind of like his thing that he does um i'm going to look up this list of things he's done um when you, you when you hear this list, you uh, realize that he's like a, a really significant uh, figure in the independent game scene. Um, we of course mentioned um, Apocalypse World. Yep, we we mentioned that. Uh, he also did uh, Kill Puppies for Satan, uh, which was rather controversial, as you might imagine. About as controversial as exploding kittens, I would say. <laughs> um, Dogs in the Vineyard, um, which is a much more serious thing, and I believe one of the um, one of the sort of selling points of that game was uh, not trusting your fellow players. Like everyone's kind of got their own agenda, and everyone's kind of paranoid of each other. Well, I never do. So yeah, there you go. Not with you guys. Um, <laughs> some of these independent game designers uh, have done a lot of um, very interesting, sometimes kind of experimental um, RPGs. Uh, they definitely break from the traditional uh, go into a dungeon, uh, kill the monsters, stick the loot. Um, and in fact, uh, Brian, I believe that um, an- another such independent uh, game designer is um, John Harper, who uh, created, uh, I-, I forget if we mentioned on 36, the uh, Lady Blackbird system. Or- we did. Not mm-hmm. system. Okay. Uh, yeah, he designed that. He also designed uh, Lasers and Feelings, which have you played that, Brian? I've run it for doc and a few of his friends i've read it for doc and will actually oh uh, cool cup i think at least three sessions um doc why don't you why don't you introduce the crew of our raptor i'm the captain acting captain <laughs> co co acting captain, captain. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah let's see i think that uh when we last left um captain ace he was standing pantsless on ten forward. Yeah, thanks to the Gene Stealers. Um, it, Gene Ste- Gene Steal. Yeah. What was the name of the captain on uh, Futurama? The um, Zap Brannigan. Yeah, yeah. Zap, yeah. That's what that was reminding me. Of. Yeah, he he's kind of a cross between Zap and um, Kirk. Okay. I always got a Zaphod Breeblebox vibe from him. You know, you're not wrong. Um, no, but when we last left off, you had essentially single-handedly eradicated an entire race of energy beings by your sheer force of charisma. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And that's why you found that space Hulk where you did, because it used to be the mothership of that race. And they took on your form and then died out because they were too dumb to live. I don't know. That was, that was plot stuff. I really wasn't paying attention. Uh, but you did manage to save the Hive Armada Princess. Lasers and Feelings is essentially a two-page RPG system intended for you to relive the, the glory of the original Star Trek series, except sillier. L- a little bit sillier. Yeah, more like the Star trek song, you know. Hey, yeah. Mm-hmm. On the starboard bow, starboard bow, starboard bow. Although, from what I read, I, I kind of got the impression that if you wanted to be more serious with it, you could. Yeah, but... I, I was the one that was running the game. Ah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. I don't do serious. <laughs> the, the, the Brian McKittrick factor. Kendrick. So when Brian is uh, running the game, you can always add but sillier to the description. <laughs> Very true. It, yeah, it, it like fate, laces fate but sillier. feelings. <laughs> Very nice. Everyone is John but sillier. <laughs> Which is 
Super silly, apparently. We, we managed to do it, though. Yep. Anyway, um, and in Laces and Feelings, you have a character who has a number, and any action they take is either lasers or feelings. And lasers is hard logic and science and technology, and you want to roll above the number. And then feelings is guts, instinct, seduction, anything that is governed by the heart and that kind of thing. And you want to roll under. And if you roll your number exactly, then you get uh, laser feelings. Uh, and you get to ask the GM one question they must ask truthfully about the situation. And based on that information, they can change their action and decide whether or not to re-roll and take a different tact. Gotcha. Which is just a super elegant system because like, built right into what you're rolling is your character concept. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, I am more science-y, I am more feelings-y. You know, it's like... Feelings-y. It's just, uh, I, I love the elegance of that um, dice mechanic. Yep. And you get more dice based on um, playing to your character's strengths. So if you... Uh, so your character has like two descriptors so they can be like a android soldier or a uh well wasn't chris a sexy scientist not you chris but the other yeah. chris <laughs> what, what was vixen fox yes yes she was a sexy scientist basically um if you're thinking of like enterprise the tv show enterprise the vulcan first mate whatever her name was I, i'm not familiar with that show did it come out before the 2000s <laughs> Oh, just kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> no, age uh, will do that first. But yeah, uh, so using your uh, your characters' descriptors, you get more dice to roll, and more successes is better, obviously. That's unless you're eight. playing Goblin Quest. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Lasers of Feelings. It's yeah, silly, but different. Were there any other games that uh, Harper had done that you uh, were thinking well, of? He's done a bunch. Um, I haven't played all of them, though. Um, I really, really loved... Um, uh, Lady Blackbird. Um, it's got some really good systems. Uh, Aegon, um, which is kind of a more long form thing. Um, I sort of came to know John Harper through like rules that can be contained in a page or two. Um, Aegon is actually a book. Um, Lasers and Feelings, of course. Um, the Mustang, uh, Ghost slash Echo, or maybe it's just pronounced Ghost Echo, uh, Ghost Lines, Lady Blackbird, and uh, Danger Patrol. Danger Patrol, I've heard of that. Yep. I saved that one for last because I figured that'd be the one that you recognized. <laughs> so. Yes, because it's the silliest of the bunch. Yep. Uh, uh, apart from Lazy and Feelings. What Danger is Patrol. It? I don't know that one. Danger Patrols is uh, Flash Gordon uh, sci fi punk sort oh, of. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, so the thing about it, it it's, its mechanics are brilliant because you are being big heroes doing dangerous things. The more danger you describe about the action you are taking, the more dice you get to roll. And so the more chances for success you have. That's cool. What's the disadvantage? Uh, the more dice you roll, the more chances you have of also having failures happen. Oh, and just those, like Goblin Quest. And basically the dis- dangers you describe will come to, tr- uh, come to light <laughs> if you fail. Nice. Um... And... and you can. Uh, there are tons of different um, character concepts and templates you can use with with moves based on each one, um, and you t- pick a combination of two. Uh, some of my favorite combinations I've seen in action are uh, the ghost detective, which is just fabulous. You are the spirit detective. I mean, what's are, not to are, love? Are you investigating ghosts or are you a ghost? Both. Nice. You're ghost detective investigating ghosts. Yes. It's almost like saying, uh, I'm, a, I'm a person detective. I'm a yeah. human detective. Uh, what? I'm a human detective that human detects detect- humans. Oh, I get it. <laughs> you can also be an alien scientist or a robot or a soldier, all that kind of thing. Nice. L- literal superhero with magic. And it, it's, it's set on Mars where you're part of the Danger Patrol protecting Rocket City from uh, basically the Russians. Or the, oh, no, communism. That sounds amazing. Speaking of patrols, did we ever mention Cosmic Patrol on the podcast? Um, I don't think so. And I'm not familiar with it. Um, so I'd have to review it. I actually do on the PDF, um, but it's been a while since I've looked at it. Uh, but it, it kind of reminds me of that in the sense that it's kind of based on um, you know 50s sort of space opera sci-fi. Um, and it's got a fairly specific setting, um, basically... Um, it's, it's set in, you know, future earth and humanity is kind of like policing their own solar system and stuff like that. Um, 
but you go on these adventures and there's there are elements of um you know fairly simple system fairly light system um but you you actually have um the players sort of rotate as the or playing the gm role to an extent um oh. there's there's kind of one person in charge for not just each session but each sort of phase of the mission um setting up the uh, complications that arise and stuff like that um so I, I can't really speak much more to it right now because I'd have to, again, refresh myself. But um, hearing the, the whole thing about Danger Patrol, um, both because of the name and because of the tone, uh, reminded me of Cosmic Patrol. You know, I had a student actually do as a project for one of my graduate classes um, an adaptation in the mm-hmm. Futurama world. Yep. And it plays Futurama beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually available um, for download. It's free. He, he contacted the creators mm-hmm. of Cosmic Patrol, and they gave him the thumbs up unofficially. Nice. Um, but, of course, due to licensing constraints... Um, oh, yeah, they can't, like, actually make yeah, it. Yeah, and, and dealing with Fox, which no one wants to do. Um, <laughs> Just ask uh, um, Joss Whedon. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I thought you were going to get political there for a second. <laughs> Just ask Donald Trump. No. Yeah. <laughs> Changing topic. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, Brian, please yes. tell us about Gangland and or uh, Last Best Hope <laughs> uh, or possibly Police Cops. I thought we were trying not to get political. <laughs> yeah. Gangs, Hope, Police. Uh. Ah. <laughs> well, uh, let's go with Gangland because uh, that deserves special mention because it's made by a different per- uh, by someone who does their own podcast. Um, really? Uh, okay. James D'Amato ha- um, is the uh, host and uh, lead lead player i guess of the actual play podcast uh the one shot podcast a uh, bunch of chicago improvisers as well as other guests come in and play one shot sessions of rpgs sounds right up our alley yeah no kidding and for last year's uh two-page tabletop uh system design contest um uh which featured uh mm-hmm. uh police cops and i believe lasers and feelings as one of as two of the entries um he was brought on as a judge um, right before he was able to submit his own system for the contest, which was Ganglands. In Ganglands, uh, it is set, or is it a game about um, reliving the experiences of those 90s movies about punk anarchy, like uh, the Warriors and uh, Double Dragon, or I think it was Double Dragon? Yeah. Where you, where each player can play a member of a gang, or make their own gangs, who have themes uh, they're they're teenage gangs oh, with nice. with themes so uh the example or the session that he played with his uh friends uh for the one shot podcast uh they were a muppet gang <laughs> nice uh and were for, they people who like dressed up as muppets or well one of them was an actual muppet oh nice because <laughs> why not and Did one you... of them was jim henson <laughs> who was nice. controlling that muppet nice and um it's it's a pretty simple uh, system where you roll uh, a d6 and try to get, I think, above or uh, below your your gang member's number uh, based on each gang member is a yeah, represents a skill your gang has, like okay. stealing, smarts, crafting, uh, and fighting. I can't remember all of them right now, but and so it's kind of like you know this is the smart guy, this is the guy who can do this thing, this is That's the guy who can know. hijack cars and nice. so on, and so. Um, that that number also represents your um that gang member's uh hit points essentially so if mm-hmm. they get if they get messed up that number goes down and it becomes harder for them to do that uh, be successful at the skill okay cool um the way to get uh the way to ensure success is to act within uh is to act on theme or act incredibly brutally violent hmm. and it's best to do both at the same time because you get more dice to roll that way. Huh. So, if you're a Muppet gang, you have to be the scariest <laughs> Muppet gang around. <laughs> Doc can to attest to, to the fact uh, when we ran our... Uh, what was our gang's name? Do you remember? Oh, no. Um, it was something about like the 90s movies or something. No, I remember it was. It was the Cylons with a Z. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Uh, you played... What was it? Harrison Ford? No, Chris played Hang- Harrison Ford. Other Chris. Other Chris. Uh, in all his movies up to that point. Yeah, it, it was like literally Harrison Ford as himself. <laughs> what a every, teenager. In, yeah, in every movie he's ever been in. Um, you should have added uh, Sean Bean to that. 
Right, right. Well, Lisa was. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. Who was Lisa? <laughs> um, I don't know. It's been months since we played. Yeah, I I remember Randall's is the one that stands out to me because he played uh, Keanu Reeves as Neo. Right. The Cylons went on to um, uh, make a big scene at the uh, the murder brawl, uh, murder prom by murder prom. Yeah, by locking everyone inside and setting fire to the building. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> among other that, things that they you did. did. You guys sound like you're uh, a horrible, uh, horrible little uh, group of miscreants that's yes. uh, ruining our society. Yes. So pretty it, much, yeah. It, yeah, it's the far future, the far dark future of 1999. Um, that sounds pretty cool, actually. Yeah, and one you should go check out Gangland. It, I don't think James D'Amato has released the finalized version of the game yet. I, I haven't seen anything about that, uh, but you should definitely check out One Shot Podcast because he's done a lot of a lot of cool systems. He's he's put a put on shows a lot of, uh, of cool systems, such as Lasers and Feelings and Police Cops, which was one of the other two page RPGs in that contest. Nice. Uh, police cops, it, just like Ganglands is meant to evoke the 90s of uh, anarchy and uh, the Warriors and those kind of movies. This police, is uh, crime dramas? Uh, yes. Or uh, police drama specifically, I guess. Honestly, I think it's more like the Naked Gun movies. Oh, okay. And, um, uh, and uh, Police Squad. Which police was, Squad, yeah. Yeah. Which is an old old series from, what, the 80s? Wait, it, 80s? Was, it was the series that... That the Naked Gun was based off of, right? Yeah, Leslie Nielsen. Yes, all that. And you play police cops who are who are walking cliches, <laughs> almost. Um, in our game alone, we had your your character was two days from retirement, wasn't he, Doc? Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, he was two days from retirement, and um, he he went back and forth between just just wanting to get the job done and fly a desk. Um, and actually cashing in on his, um, what was it, life insurance for dying on the job because uh, it paid out double. Mm. But um, he had no beneficiary, so it really didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, uh, he, he ended up surviving everything and, and not actually being able to, uh, to, to do either one of those goals. So if the game was an actual movie... There would be a post credit scene where, where it would, like, freeze frame on a still from the movie of each character and describe what they did after the movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yours probably would have been died two days after the events of the film. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> of a coronary, probably. Yeah. Died of a heart attack at his retirement party. <laughs> there retirement. you go. <laughs> uh, but the, the cool thing about Police Cops is um, similar to Shadowrun, uh, you roll D6s and try to get a five or a six to count successes. Uh, and in you have to hit a target number of successes to succeed at an action. And the way you build your dice pool is based off of uh, three simple stats you pick at the beginning of character creation, as well as any additional skill dice that you can add based on the action you're taking. And the way you determine each character's skill is round-robin style. So the first character picks something they're good at. The next character to their left is bad at that skill. So they may pick something they're good at. And the next person from them p- uh, says they're bad at that skill. And so on until everyone has at least three. Interesting. And then you assign um, numerical values to each of those skills that you're good and bad at. So you have plus three, plus two, and plus one dice for your good skills. And minus one, minus two, and minus three for your bad skills. So you just um, spread them between the six skills. And then you have your character, basically. And whenever um, you take an action that has a skill that applies, you roll those dice with it. Or subtract them if you're bad at it. So I think one of them was mustache grooming in our game. Yes. Yes, indeed. And hostage negotiation. Which never came up. I, I, think, we, I think you actually managed to swing hostage negotiation and mustache grooming into the same skill roll. Because really? you used your mustache to intimidate the criminal. Oh, yeah, that's right. We need right. to do police cops again, though. <laughs> um, we need to play it. Again? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It sounds like a lot of these might be uh, worth doing on uh, unplugged at some point. Exactly. So. <laughs> um, and speaking of all these, uh, all this talk of the '90s makes me intrigued to hear about um, straight to VHS. Now, this is one I've just recently found out. A friend recommended it to me because he knew I like stupid, silly stuff. <laughs> a straight to VHS, like the title suggests, is all about those action movies that went straight to VHS. Now, yep. kids. Do you know what a VHS is? 
Yeah, that's all those other channels that uh, aren't UHS. <laughs> uh, it, does it make you feel old or young to say uh, f- to ha- hear me say that I actually know what a VHS is? No, it's 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 um it's reassuring. It's comforting. Yeah, we're not yeah. we're not that old yet. Yeah, actually, I, I grew up with VHSs myself. Um, I remember when DVDs were the next big thing, and like we were all excited because like you know DVDs are more expensive than VHSs when they first came out. So and they so must be like, better. Yeah, well, not only that, but it's like the the appeal was like all the uh, special features and stuff. So it's like you, you'd, you'd sort of debate which movies you just wanted to get on VHS and which on DVD because it's like, oh man, I like this movie so much, I really want to see the behind the scenes, and so you'd you know get the DVDs for those and then just VHS for the rest. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, straight to VHS is all about those those terrible eighties action movies that never left VHS. Um, it's it's about playing the. The, the cliched heroes that go in fist swinging, guns blazing, and, and cracking one liners. Um, and what's interesting or what's awesome about it is that um, there are mechanical rewards for acting like it is an 80s movie. Nice. <laughs> nice. So once per combat or once per scene, I believe, um, you get a, a, a bonus die to roll if you crack a one liner. <laughs> I, I think. Within the game itself, it's called an epic die. Um, so you get an epic die for the first one-liner you crack in combat, which just encourages players to make puns, which just ends up in a terrible spiral of her horrible, which is why you only get rewarded once. Note to self, Will Parsons is not allowed to play this game. <laughs> no, Will Parsons will run that game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's, the, he's a good judge of puns. So. Yeah. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't taken the time to go through the entire pack it and uh and like read it all the way through uh but what i've seen i i i I, uh i approve of very nice uh it's it's definitely good about uh evoking the feel of of cheesy action flicks so bad they're good i'm like really reminded of last action hero which was um arnold schwarzenegger's sort of i don't know last true action film before he became the governor. Uh, was that the, now, was that the movie? I haven't seen it, but is that the movie where he's like, uh, the kid goes to the movies and then he steps out of the screen or something? Yes. Cause he has a magic ticket. And so he ends up in the film, but then Schwarzenegger's character actually comes out of the film and there's, it's full of pulpy one liners in that way. Like he kills a guy with an ice cream cone and then <laughs> says something like, um, that had to hurt, to cone a phrase. It's like, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. Everybody just freeze. Yeah. <laughs> like, or was it, was it just chill? Just chill. The <laughs> golden <laughs> phrase. So if yeah. we ever play uh, straight to VHS, Chris is going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger again, isn't he? But of course. Because no. only you can do the voice justice. This is going to happen. Nice. Excellent. Everyone is John straight to VHS. <laughs> we just need to take a, all of these ga- these simple games and mash them into one giant monstrosity Frankenstein thing. Cool. Well, I guess <coughs> excuse me. It could be um, it could be uh, police cops versus uh, gangland. Oh, there you go. I, I want to be the Corys. Mm. Um, you know, as in Corey Ham and Corey Feldman. <laughs> actually, simultaneously, I don't get be, that joke. There should no, be you a, wouldn't. There should be a game called Everyone Is John, and it's literally just one guy named John. But he's got a bunch of gang members inside his head. There you go. So, or it's just a gang of John. Yeah, <laughs> gang of John. <laughs> it's it's John Malkovich, uh, John Madden. Uh, <laughs> I've run Maggio. out of Johns. <laughs> I've run out of Johns. John Smith. Uh, John Galt. Which is, which is funny, given how, like, how many Johns there are. John uh, Galt gang would be terrifying. <laughs> uh, don't forget Don Juan. Now, who is John Galt? Uh, no, like seriously. The, <laughs> no, the, the, yeah um <laughs> so um it looks like the uh the other one we have written down here is um last best hope last best hope also featured on one shot podcast and based off of uh the fiasco rule sets okay uh so it's uh more narrative focused uh although it's it's it involves more rolling than um fiasco does uh, mm-hmm. usually uh, in last best hope um you uh, the players are the Earth's last best hope for survival. Um, it's, it's inspired by movies like uh, Armageddon, and uh, it, you hear the sound of geologists grinding their teeth everywhere when you say <laughs> the core. 
<laughs> but uh, but it's those disaster movie was movies. hot, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's those disastrous movies where um, it's a small specialist team who are. It's a million to one shot, but they have to do it to save the world. The mm-hmm. thing about one last best hope is that it's not guaranteed you'll succeed. Mm-hmm. Like in Fiasco, when you re- uh, when everyone rolls to determine what they end up with in the end of the game, um, you need to have a certain number of dice built up against the challenge rating of the disaster facing Earth so that you can outroll it and win. Because if you don't, the Earth is destroyed. Gotcha. Uh-huh. Uh, and like Fiasco, there's a bunch of play sets and uh, tables to roll on to determine what kind of disaster is facing the r- world. It could be the moon falling out of the sky, or the weather going out of whack, or the core stop spinning, or zombies. So suddenly I kind of want to play um, a Majora's Mask scenario in this system. Well, the earth or the moon falling out of the sky was done by one shot. Uh, and oh, cool. they failed, so we could try and, and uh, one-up them. The question is, do we, uh, do we have access to a time-traveling ocarina? Uh, no, probably uh, not. Then, yeah, we're all doomed then. One neat mechanic about Last Best Hope is that uh, before you start playing, or I think it's a uh, part of character creation, I'd have to look this up, um, you get a card that says how your character dies. And when your character dies, you have to work it into the narrative uh, how it applies. Gotcha. So it could be like sacrificing yourself to save another, or an honest mistake is lethal, or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's a cool idea. Actually, it reminds me a little bit of... Um uh, we haven't really announced anything official about this yet, but that game we were working on, Doc, um, title still pending, uh, where you have... It's a great title. Yeah, <laughs> title pending. Um, where everyone is kind of given a... Uh, you are the character who goes on to do this at some point in the story. Um, and some for some of the characters, it is you know dying or um, that sort of thing. So it's been long enough since we've worked on it that I'm kind of like drawing a blank on exactly how that worked, but it reminds you know. me a little bit of, um, uh, night, which is with the marked system. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. But yeah. Last best hope is one of those games where you, it can work as a super serious, we're going to save the world or die trying kind of tone or mm-hmm. stupid, silly fun. Like most of the games I bring up and as a topic. Yeah. It's uh, it, it, the Brian effect does apply to uh, last best hope. That's every game that's going to be on Unplugged, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe. Every one, much, everyone yeah. you run. <laughs> I, I think we should call it the McKittrick effect, though, and, <laughs> and then like make it into a Michael Crichton book. Gotcha. <laughs> nice. Except for his last one, which was actually good. There's probably an RPG about that, actually. But he died before he finished it, so he didn't have a chance to fully screw it up. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, just to uh, kind of start winding us down a little bit, I recall we, uh, we mentioned, what was it, the, um, the micro, 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 micro RPG? Yes. An RPG about a, a podcast hosted by uh, Corvids about the host of Dirty Jobs. And it's an RPG. So the micro, micro, micro P- RPG. Oh, my. And it's a micro RPG in the sense that it is a small... Yes. Like, yeah. Very nice. And then uh, I think we also talked about making an RPG based on um, Buffalo, 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 Buffalo. I forget how many Buffaloes. It's seven. It's seven. seven. Okay. But two yeah. of them are capitalized. Mm-hmm. Because it's the city Buffalo. Yeah, I believe it's the first and the fifth that mm. are capitalized. But you always capitalize the first word of a sentence. So no, how could you tell? True. You underline it as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll take your word for it. You're an English uh, major. Yeah, you know, I was an English teacher, so um, don't don't argue with me. <laughs> or I'll get extra reading assignments, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> so maybe a future project for us is to um, make a list of good um, R pungies. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> That's your next Twitter account, isn't it? Yeah, no, that, that, that is the, the makeshift RPG we'll make. It's an, it's an RPG with a pun mechanic, and we call it our pun G. <laughs> we'll have to uh, consult with Will on that one for sure. But uh. Wow. Yeah, because that's kind of subjective. How would you... Uh... You just give a context, and then you reward players for making puns, and then the the person who wins is the one who doesn't die on the inside first. <laughs> Wow. So full circle to uh, Exploding Kittens. That's uh, its last one standing. Yeah, there we go. Uh, actually, what we could do is have a thing where you um, have a uh, some sort of sound recorder going on, and it's measuring the decibel level of people's groans. Oh. And ah. the higher the decibel level, the more effective the uh, the role, so to speak. You know, they did that on 70s TV for years. 
I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Live live shows that had the audience's reaction as a part of. Mm. Yeah. Huh. Kind of like the uh, the the real thing that later became Candle Laughter on uh, modern comedies. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, kind of a, a gong show sort of principle. Gotcha. Yeah. What's a gong show? Yeah, it was before the '90s. You wouldn't know it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us for uh, episode number 40 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. And thank you, Brian, once again, for joining us to talk about oddball RPGs. That's I'm glad four... to be here when the podcast gets over the hill. <laughs> That's four decades of podcasts. Something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so We recorded these on eight tracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we, there should be a, um, a, a follow-up to Straight to VHS called Straight to Betamax. <laughs> so, it nice. dies faster than the VHS. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, maybe a straight to laser disc. I heard that a system was obsolete. Mm-hmm. Indeed. See what I did there? Yes. Okay. We can go back even further and go to straight to wax cylinder. Oh, nice. Or uh, straight to uh, the, the silent films RPG. There you go. Yeah, nice. Right. Straight it's, to vinyl? It's all, it's all pantomime or something. Oh, that's good. That's called charades. <laughs> Except you're role playing. Uh, and not just guessing what someone's doing to make a fool of themselves. I did a mime in uh, Everyone is John one time. Nice. It worked out well. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Cool. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. I'm Brian. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye, guys. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave the comments in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your experiences with any of the RPGs we mentioned today. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.